side we are here for you we are here for you let your breath come from heaven let your breath come from heaven fill our hearts with your life we are here for you are open to you our hearts are open nothing here is hidden you are what desire you alone are holy only you are worthy God let your fire fall down let our shouts let our shouts
help us shout to the Lord. Go on. Good morning. The Lord was saying to me this morning that, you know that feeling that we have at the new year about newness and, and we, we get a new chance. We get a new, as God's sons and daughters, we should feel that every day, every single day. Every, it says, his word says, his mercies are new every morning. Every morning his mercies are new. Great is his faithfulness. Every morning we, we get to have a clean slate. Every morning we get another chance to get it right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Every morning.
turn our hands to him and Holy Spirit pull. This will be my resting place. This will be my landing pad for his glory. And so, Lord, we are open to whatever you have for us today, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. And we are open to whatever you desire, God. That's all we want. We want you, Jesus. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest. 
rest on us. Come rest on us. And fire and rain, come do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Lift it up to the Lord. Whoa, sing a song only you can sing. Oh, na 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 yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, na 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa, whoa. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. Let's declare it. This is a house of healing. This is a house of healing. Our hearts are full of faith. You have our full attention. You have the final say. Come alive. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of me. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come alive, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Even the coldest 
feet of Jesus every day. Spirit is saying he wants to deal with grief right now. I feel like on many of us it's become a weight on your chest, even grief over our nation. So if that's you, just put your hand over your chest area, over your heart. And Lord, I thank you in your name. We command a spirit of grief to go in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for the loosing of a sustained, supernatural, consistent joy 
welling up in the future, in your promises, in your words to us personally, in the as we move in the giftings. And Lord, I thank you for absolutely eradicating. I feel he's saying I'm breaking patterns of thinking about disappointment, grief, sorrow. We break your power in Jesus' name. That's why many of you have been so weary. We break weariness in Jesus' name. Thank you for life. It's his will to repeatedly fill us, fill us, fill us every day. Every day. Lord, thank you. We are coming to receive your life in your holy name. You know, I told you about two weeks ago, a spirit was sent to me and he had to bow down about 50 feet away from me. And um, I didn't quite know what it was. And the Lord said, I'm sending this thing. And he's having to bow down before me. Every knee will bow before me. And he must confess who he is. He said, I am sadness. And he did not want me to know who he was. And Lord told me, you know, I'm breaking sadness over your people, over my people. I'm breaking that. I'm breaking in. Yesterday in prayer, uh, on uh, Saturday morning prayer, I noticed that it was sustained by the, by the victory of faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And uh, that's what's coming for the new year. I told Mary, uh, Marnie, I said, Marnie, that was, you were, you know, the fire of God was on you. But it's because he's declaring victory for you and me in this coming year. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith, even your wavering faith, whatever it is. It's the faith of the Son of God. I do not preach that faith is something we must do. Faith is something we must receive. It's a gift of God and a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The faith that you have is the faith of the Son of God. So we thank you for victory in this year through all the things that we'll go through. Amen and glory to your name alone, Lord. Amen. Can we declare it one more time over ourselves, over this church, over our family, that this year, we will be a house of healing. Our hearts will be full of faith, God. And it, there will be signs and wonders. And come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is the house of Yesterday, I did something very simple. I looked upon what was around me in the place where I live. And every morning, I usually have one cup of coffee. But I knew the cup was done. It represented a sign of intercession as I had prayed for this particular representation on this cup. But the new cup that I cleaned out and it was ready to go, it was brand new. And that cup said faith. 
And I felt it was a sign of a turning into this new year, that we would be a people of faith. And as we read about faith in the book of Hebrews, that there is substance to that faith. And so Lord, we pray even today, as we talk about the gifts, as we talk about breaking strongholds off of us, let us be a people of faith with substance that will bring transformation and change. So Lord, may there be a new release of the substance to the people of God today in Jesus. I just wanted to share something that the Lord gave me um, about, a, about a month, a little, little more than a month ago. And we were singing about lifting Jesus higher. So I was looking up, and I was like, where are you, Jesus? <laughs> and in my mind's eye, I saw him above the earth, just above the earth, the whole earth. But he was in a brooding position. He was brooding over the earth like a hen brooding over her eggs. And the eggs were about to hatch any, any moment. And, and then he gave me the scripture, you know, look to the fields, they are white already under harvest. And, and then I was thinking about something he had been speaking to me earlier, and that goes along with um, the words that we heard today, was um, he wants everyone involved in the harvest. He wants to use everyone. And, there's so many people out there that are hurting, that are lost and lonely. And even if we give them just a warm smile, a kind word, or, or we just reach out to them in different ways, like even at the supermarket, getting something down for them, just that really um, softens their heart and makes them more open to believe that there is a God out there that really cares. And, and then also he was telling me about moving in the gifts. He wants us to believe him for all the, the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, but to use them wherever we are, and that will bring them to attention, and they'll know that God is real. And so, Lord, I just pray that you're going to use us in many different ways, Lord, that, that we'll be sensitive to your Holy Spirit wherever we are, where, wherever it might be. In some gathering, even with family, at the supermarket, or wherever we are, Lord, help us to be open to you, to use us, to have the faith to move at the prompting of your Holy Spirit. We love you. We thank you that you can use all of us and that this is the time of, of the end time harvest. Moses stood on the mountain Waiting for you to pass by You put your hand over his face So in your presence he wouldn't die All of Israel saw the glory And it shines out through the age Now you call me to boldly seek your face And show me Show me your face. 
Amen. He is worthy of it all, isn't he? Let's praise him right now. Because we love you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We magnify your holy, mighty name. You are worthy of it all. You saved us. You are among us. You live in us. You are the living God. And we praise your mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. Now is a good time to do communion. That's what we're going to do. Lord, I just praise you today. Thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you, blessed, most wonderful Holy Spirit. How we love you. You are leading us and guiding us into all truth. And you are helping us worship God in spirit and in truth. And we thank you today for the privilege being the children, sons, and daughters of the living God. We bless you for talking to us this morning. Restore the testimony of Jesus among us like never before. And may the sheep hear his voice and discern the others and uh, reject them. And we thank you for your mercy and grace, Lord. Amen. Excuse me. I should have said they will not listen to another. That's what he said. You know, um, when I was thinking about getting ready for this, I, I've been intrigued by a, uh, is that better? <laughs> by a verse in Hebrews 10, and I'm going to have, have it put up in the uh, New Living Translation. Hebrews 10, verse 5. When Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. And I was really stuck on that phrase, when Christ came into the world, it's telling us how Jesus saw the incarnation. What we've just celebrated, when he came, when he came to take on a new form, when he came to take on a human body, he said to his father, you didn't want animal sacrifices, but you've given me a body. It's a gift. He saw the human body as a gift, a love gift from his father. He, he received it, and then he knew what it was given to him for, a body to offer. He took on flesh and blood so that he would be able to make a sacrifice of this body that he was given. And he went on to say, verse 7, Hebrews 10, 7, then I said, this is Jesus speaking, Look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. He saw this human body as a gift, a, a delightful opportunity to carry out the will of God and to fulfill the words of God that had been spoken through the Old Testament prophets. He, he was so connected with what the Father wanted to accomplish through the Incarnation, of, of his son in a human body. You know, the father had not been satisfied with all of those sacrifices that had been offered through the Old Testament. Even though he asked for them, they couldn't satisfy him because they could never take away sin. And so his perfect plan was to have that perfect sacrifice that would once for all take away our sin. I don't know, have they already passed out everything? Okay, I'm just checking. <laughs> So Jesus said, I will be the one to make that perfect offering. I will be the one to do the will of my Father, to accomplish what's been in his heart. Because the Father wanted a people that were made clean and able to come to him and be incorporated into his family for all eternity. This was the cry of the Father's heart that Jesus was saying, I came, I took this body to do your will. It's a beautiful verse. So then <clears throat> we see in, in Hebrews 10.10, 10, further on in this chapter, what God's will is. It was God's will for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. And then verse 14 goes on to talk about that. By that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. 
We have been made perfect in the sight of God, but we are being made holy in our walk, in our obedience, in our submission, in our yieldedness to him, in coming into that state of uh, agreement with our Father that we are our, our children who enjoy him and who partner with him on what, in what he's doing on the earth. So we're about to partake of a victory meal. The victory meal of our Lord over all the principalities and powers, over Satan, sin, sickness, disease, everything that would separate us from our Father. We are rejoicing in that today. So we take um, the, the bread. We remind ourselves that this is his body. The body that the Father prepared and fitted for him to come and occupy on this earth the body he offered back to his father in love as a sacrifice so that we can stand in the presence of God, forgiven and clean and made entirely new, pure and complete in his sight. Incredible. Thank you, Father. And this is his blood, the blood of the new covenant. And that new covenant proclaims that his law, his ways, his nature have been infused into our hearts and minds. Isn't that awesome? It's in us. God's laws have been placed within us, written on us, making us like his son so that we can respond to him out of a heart that's like his, out of a mind that's aligned with his. So we drink this in humble confidence that the power of the blood is released through every part of our being and we have been made his true sons so we thank you lord we thank you for your great eternal plan of redemption and we thank you jesus for the tremendous victory of your cross you can pass the cups to the side aisles So now we're going to transition into announcements. <laughs> Next Sunday, almost immediately after the service, we're going to be having a training, a first aid training. It's been in the announcements. It's also called Stop the Bleed. It's, about, it's going to be a very practical training in how we can help people in a time of crisis. And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, when some giant earthquake comes, you could be around a kid who falls and cracks his head open on the sidewalk. I mean, we, we really ought to always be ready to offer whatever assistance we can. And I think this is critical for us to step up and take the opportunity that's being given to be taught and trained. This woman is, I can't remember what her name is, but uh, Marcy uh, has, been, has been teaching this for a long time. Lisa Whitman knows her and has set this up for us so that we can as a body be equipped to do practical things in a time of need a time of crisis so I just encourage all of you to plan to stay afterward we think it's going to be about an hour an hour and a half max so it's not like going to take your whole afternoon so please join us next Sunday afternoon amen that's so uh yeah and uh, let let uh, Kim know, our administrator, just email the church office and say you're coming because we're ordering supplies so we can practice doing some of this stuff. <laughs> Amen. Kara, wherever you are, are you here? Yeah, I'll, I'll call you up um, after the uh, offering, give that testimony. Um, I wanted to uh, mention, um, I think, how many people do we already have signed up for that? I think 45 people. So you're taking it seriously, right? And we should. It's probably one of the best things that we can do at this time. Um, you know, if you've ever been in a public situation where someone faints or whatever, you know, it's nice to have somebody there, right? And uh, what a more wonderful thing. Um, what more can we do to help others and um, be there at the right place at the right time? And just a minute, Wesley, who is in charge of our children's church, she's going to come up. And actually, we helped um, at least three outreaches. Why don't you stand up, Betty? Betty Bond, she moves. 
She reaches out. Betty, come up for a minute. Come up for a minute. She reaches out and has for many, many years as an evangelist on the street. And we were able to give her some money uh, earlier this year. And I'll talk to you later about it. But I just want to say she's a soul winner. Praise the Lord. Love you, sister. And I mean it. Yeah, you're a, a blessing. Also, uh, obviously, Clayton, who um, hope for homeless youth. Uh, that is, uh, we've been known him for 25, 30 years, I guess. And uh, has been on the streets ministering possibly more than anybody else that's still out there. And uh, I truly uh, love and respect him. We've been helping him. And then Wesley, when she comes up, that'll be great. Otherwise, um, are you guys okay? Is she here? I can't tell. Oh, sorry. It's uh, my eyes. Come on up. You were on an angle or something. I couldn't see. So tell us what's happening, what you did. Briefly let us know. And then are you going to put the pictures up now? Just let them go up while she's talking, maybe. Is that okay? Yeah. Sounds great. Ready? Here she is. Hi. Our children's church pastor. Hallelujah. Thank oh, amen. You. That's amen. who we are. Yeah. I, yes, I love our children. They're amazing. My name is Wesley. I run an organization called Faith Child Ministry. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, you guys have poured into our ministry. This church has poured into our ministry and made our Christmas party possible. You can see on the screen, we had hundreds of um, people come out for, to receive Christmas presents and receive um, and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we served food, big meal, and had all these families come out. I reached out to dozens upon dozens of social workers that are in the area. And we partner with um, the social services to refer families to us and a local domestic violence shelter. And we, there's a lot of people that you can't, we can't be pictured, um, but these are the ones that we were able to picture. And we had such an incredible time. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> we had such an incredible time. Um, they came out and they ate and they rejoiced and we played like we had a snowball fight. And oh we, <laughs> we did we a that. snowball fight with, you know, not real snowballs, but, and then we played all these games and we sang songs and we rejoiced with them. We served food. And then, of course, we, the whole point is for them to, we display the joy of Jesus to them, and then we tell them about the joy of Jesus, and it's, it comes hand in hand, right? So I had typically planned out in these events, I have the children act out the Christmas story, because when you're talking about hundreds of people, children that are like two years old all the way to 17 years old, they don't usually sit still for very long. But you know, it was really fascinating this year. There was such a peace, even though the kids were jumping up and down, they were so excited. There was such a peace when we got to the Christmas story that they all just sat down and all the parents gathered around them and they just stared right at me. And it was like a holy moment. Wow. It really was, it was powerful. And I, I just went on and I spoke for 15 to 20 minutes just about the, the Emmanuel, God with us, God coming down to earth. And I was looking at the, the faces of these children and these parents, I was talking about, you know, life is really hard sometimes, isn't it? And all the kids and the parents, and the, especially the moms, the single moms with like lots of kids, they're like, yeah, it's really hard. And the truth of the gospel is that Jesus comes into a dark, broken world, Glory. right? A yeah. dark and broken world. And so when I teach children and, and teenagers and adults who are, you know, in horrible situations, I don't say to them, Jesus is just going to fix everything and make it easy. But I say to them, Jesus is going to come into the midst of your broken, Glory. painful places, into your heartbreak, and into all the things that are just tearing you down inside. And Jesus is going to meet you in that place of brokenness, and he's going to bring comfort and joy. Mm -hmm. And I asked the kids, like, what is joy? And they were like, well, it's happiness. And I was like, it's, it's a little bit different than that, though. It's deeper than happiness. It goes deeper than happiness. It's a supernatural feeling. And we got to bless the children and pray over them. And I like to, when, especially when I have all the parents there, I like to pray over the entire um, family line mm. and pray over the bloodline and bless them. And it was so great because I had the kids just like, I just told them and the parents, just repeat after me if you want this, if you want Jesus. And everybody was praying with us, just hundreds of people praying with us and rejoicing. And Glory. it was such an amazing, amazing time. It was by far the best Christmas party that we've ever put on. 
and I just was so thrilled and I am so thankful that you guys poured in. And then of course, after that, we give out like hundreds and hundreds of Christmas presents, right? And so the kids line up and they get all these Christmas presents and they're just like gleaming from ear to ear. And then we hand out Bibles. We had Bibles that we were able to purchase with the funds that you gave us, the children's Bibles and teenager Bibles. Because if you just hand a six-year-old like a full Bible, they're like, what do I do with this? So I'm like, look, it's a Bible with comic book pictures. And the kids are like, this is awesome. So it was incredible. And I just want to thank you guys for your prayer covering and for the finances that you've poured in. It's amazing. We appreciate you so much. Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, my goodness. What's that, Ben? Is that, oh, oh, okay, right. Um, I just want to say this. We're very, 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 very thankful that she's leading our children's church down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That fire on her is going to get on your kids, so watch out. Amen. And uh, we just love you and bless you. Thanks this can be the best year we've ever had, kiddo. Amen. Amen. Together, we'll do it. Yes. Amen. Well, we uh, really are thankful for her. Um, it's just amazing what God is doing. And uh, next year, if it gets even bigger, I mean, hundreds of people. Lord, we just praise you for every one of those kids for their families, Lord, and let it be bigger next year and help us give more and help some of us go down there and volunteer. Same with Clayton, same with um, Betty Bond over here as well, Lord, the evangelism among us, Lord. And uh, I just praise you for her uh, ministry. I praise you for Clayton, for Betty, and everybody else that's out there on the street, Lord, ministering to the people even as you prophesied through Marnie and also through uh, Andrea. Lord, uh, we're gonna be there too. Help us also equip us next week to be people that can help people when they're really hurting physically or something happens or a car accident near us or who knows what. But um, make us a salvation army like never before. This is a year. We're going into a whole new year. Amen. Don't you feel good about that? Everybody likes that, don't they? Um, we'll go ahead and put up the uh, um, information for uh, uh, giving. Um, I do want to say, uh, we know, and you'll hear a little bit more, but we know that um, the birth pangs are increasing. And uh, famines and so forth, there's already famines in much of Africa and uh, some of you know we've been, I first went to Africa in 1984, traveled over nine different nations in Africa at different times, mostly Malawi. Uh, after that, I started going to Malawi specifically. And our dear brother, Joseph Masambuka, who I can count on to do things and spread things out, we've been able to feed uh, hundreds, particularly of Christians in Malawi. And... Uh, but uh, they're on the verge of something terrible. As I said, the other nations do not want to deal with them and do the forex exchanges of currency because their currency is worth nothing. You got it? So we can see what's coming. And I was, Pam and I were listening to uh, a tape by uh, Sean Malone. Anybody know who he is? Cry, Crisis Response International. He's a wonderful man. And... Uh, um, anyway, uh, he's out there. But um, I just thank you, Lord, for the giving that we have and that we can give. We were able to give and others gave to her as well. So um, if you're giving a check, credit card, or cash today, you can see it in the envelopes. And um, you, you can put it in the envelopes, I mean. And I just want to praise God for the giving in this church, Lord. I really thank you for those who actually tithe and give and I praise you for your faithfulness. And uh, those are good works that we can do with this money. And we're very, very thankful uh, to be able uh, to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll go ahead. Kara, if you don't mind, I think I'm in a, somewhat of a role right now. And I want to continue on and then want the testimony at the end. I won't forget. But I, um, I want to tell you a, a few things that... Um, the, the word I have today is concerning the immense calling 
on you. The immense calling on you. So I have to kind of keep it serious right now. And um, I, I want to just mention, it was mentioned of faith today, and, and uh, the spirit of faith, of victory that was in our prayer meeting yesterday made it one of the most wonderful prayer meetings we've been involved, Pam and I, for over 40 years and doing sometimes three to four prayer meetings a week, sometimes more, but sometimes a little bit less, but usually around there, three at least. And um, yesterday I felt such a spirit of faith. I thought, what is this? Oh my gosh, this is a spirit of faith bringing, birthing victory. Take it, not birthing it, taking it to another level. And um, I just want to show you something, what Jesus saw. It, and uh, it's in the three different gospels. If remember when he, um, uh, what did he do now? Oh yeah, he uh, uh, made the um, boat get to the other side, right? <laughs> because he uh, rebuked the storm, right? But you know, he did something else, and it's actually, um, it's actually uh, uh, Luke 8.25. Listen to this. He turns to them and says, in Luke 25, it's said three different ways in the Bible. He turns to them and says, where is your faith? <laughs> no. What? They were astonished at him. What manner of man is this? He was basically saying, and I'll show you the scripture. You've been with me quite a while here. You could have done it. That's what he was telling them. And then in Acts chapter four, I believe it's verse 13, it says they were astonished at the boldness and courage of Peter and them when they spoke out. And then they, they said, oh, oh, we remember. They were with Jesus. So I, to some degree, um, well, a big degree, compared to what I was when I first became a Christian, I'm walking closer with the Lord, and I found the secret in the Bible. It happens to be the teachings of Jesus. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me. Abiding ones are growing more and more into unity with Jesus. The abiding ones will become the bride and among other things because it's Christ in them that's being developed in us as we abide in him and he flows into us. And uh, so Jesus is what's happening. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, 8 and 9 basically say that you, you will, you've been called uh, and will be kept to the end, 1 Corinthians 1, 8. And then in verse 9, it says that the Father has set you up to have communion or union or fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. The Father puts you into the vine to cause you to be an abiding one, which I'll read those verses in a little bit. They're extremely serious. Uh, your life depends on it. Your life depends on what I'm teaching you because Jesus is your life. And you must draw near to him, especially in this day that he's calling us all to first love. So anyway, I want to um, just tell you, uh, we don't need to go there on this one, but it's Genesis 1, 26 and 27, which I've taught many times, that original intent was for Adam and Eve to rule and have dominion, okay? Then it goes on to say in Psalm 110, verse 2, if you can put that up there, you're so fast here. The Lord will extend his mighty scepter from Zion. What does it say? Yeah. You know, what Jesus basically said to those guys is, you could have done this, but it was way beyond their ability. But soon after that, especially the baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, in Acts 2, that they were recognized by the people who were eventually going to persecute them. These guys had been with Jesus. And that's what we need to realize was the key. Yes, the Holy Spirit coming was a major key, the blessed Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. He's going to lead you and he is leading and guiding you to do one thing especially is to learn to be an abiding one in Jesus Christ. So Let's look at this. I want you to see, uh, well, let, let, me, give me, let me give you another verse. Romans 5, or excuse me, Revelation 5.10. 
Revelation 5.10 is a verse that I'll call it one of my DNA verses. It's written on my heart. And um, it's basically that most of the translations don't do it correctly. That you may be, it says kingdom, which is not the word in the Greek at all. And I don't know why these theologians haven't found that out. But it's the word, he's made you to be kings and priests. Primarily, you put those two together, you rule in your prayers as a priest and as a king or a queen, if we want to say that, it's fine with me. Many women are ruling. Rick Joyner said years ago when he was up in the heavenly realm that he saw so many single moms close to the throne. Wouldn't be just single moms, but you know, mothers and so forth, but he said that. And um, you know, we all have concerns about our families, our loved ones, people we know. And I'll just put it to you straight. The Lord is basically saying, take authority over the enemy. You do it. I've given you authority over all the plans and purposes of the devil. I've given you authority over the power of the enemy, right? Luke, you know, we all know that one. That's just dealing with demons. Principalities and powers is a little different, which I don't think I'll discuss today. But we, we are called to, be, to absolutely rule in the midst of our enemies. And the enemies are the ones who are attacking primarily your family and those you love. Yes. Drive him out. Yes. Drive them out. I have images flash into my mind primarily about my grandkids or my children. And you know what I do when they come? I say, no. It's a seed of Satan to put fear in me or whatever. I say, no, forbidden. It's all over in a moment of time. Now, I'm not perfect. I can get sidetracked, but when I, by the time I connect with the Lord in the morning or later on in the afternoon or sometimes before, for sure before I go to bed, I, I am waiting. Okay, what's, what's going on? What was happening today? I forbid that in Jesus' name in my family. And I stand on that and I believe what I'm saying is true. I told you before, when I was relatively a baby Christian, I was taught by the Word of Faith people. They said, they talked about binding the devil, you know. And of course, it's Matthew 16. And uh, I used to, I've said the story, so I'll keep it quick. I used to go into a place where I got my hair cut, and I'd feel lust in there. It was, a, you know, men and women getting their hair cut and everything. And uh, I'd feel lust in there. I, was, I didn't feel lust before until I'd walk in there, you know. I never really, even in the bars I went into, I didn't feel it. But I went in there. Now I'm a Christian. I'm not in the bars. I'm in a, getting my hair cut. And I feel the lust. And the Lord said, you should bind it. I said, okay, fine. So I bound it, and then I went in. It was great. One time, I went in without binding it, and I bound it inside, and it was only 40 or 50% as effective as before going in when I was not in the midst of it and breaking the power of it. I was a baby Christian, so anybody could do it. It's the way I look at it. That's why I'm preaching it. But you have authority over the demonic powers that are coming against your family, your bloodline, even your city and other things. If you're a praying man and woman, you are sitting as a priest and a king. And of course, you grow up into that. You know, there are some people that are moving in much more authority and some less. But you all have authority in the name of the Lord to rule and reign over things that are dark in your family bloodline, praise be to God. But when I first started finding this out, when the Holy Spirit began to speak this to me, at first I was kind of disappointed. I thought, well, God, you do it. And he was basically saying to me, no, I'm gonna have you do it. Like he said to those guys on that boat, God, aren't you gonna let us drown, Lord? He rebukes the storm, then he turns and rebukes them. Where was your faith? See what I'm saying? I'm saying, where's your faith? It's a responsibility to have that kind of faith and to have that responsibility of saying no to the powers of darkness. That is, I'm talking about drugs and depression and all kinds of things that come upon us, our families or whatever. You rule and reign, you take authority over it and you take your stand with your spouse or close friends. Two, if two or three dwell, if two or three get together, Jesus says, I'm right there. So if you think you're weak in your faith, get another friend who's weak in their faith, and then Jesus will be right there, and your faith will go to new levels immediately. Amen. 
He said he would be there. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And uh, I choose um, to believe that. I know it's absolutely true. Now, Romans, or excuse me, Revelation 5.10, which we have had up there, made you as uh, kings and priests, check it out in the Greek yourself, to serve our God, uh, and they will what? And they will what? Rain. Rain on the earth. Now look at. I just want to tell you something. The next few verses talk about in Revelation 6.2 about the Antichrist, the man in the white horse, going forth. Now, I told you in April of this year, I mentioned it then, that's when it happened, I was sitting in my uh, little prayer uh, room there, and uh, the, uh, one of the bedrooms, and uh, the Lord said, the four horses of the apocalypse are running. Whoa, really? And then um, I told uh, the people who were under in Morningstar, Tom and Marianne, I said, Tom, you know, because sometimes they have a little prophetic group, I said, Tom, uh, he told me the four horsemen of the apocalypse are running. He goes, oh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll remember you said that. And then, but, but prior to the four horsemen running is this verse. Is this verse. This happens before and while the Antichrist is starting his thing. Some people feel they know who he is, whatever. Uh, and it's very possible it's true. But the point is, he's moving. He's begun to move. Antichrist fears. Why do we know? Because tyranny has come to the whole world. And it all came in the form of what? A demand. Don't, don't disagree with us. We'll get you fired. Then take this, take that, whatever. So it's tyranny. And, uh, but it says that we will reign on the earth prior. So the Lord is raising up his army of who I'm preaching to, and then the Antichrist is raising up. They even have a plan, you know, Klaus, uh, whatever his name is, Schmidt or something. They're going to, you know, pretty much have their whole little reset by 2030. They're in big trouble. They don't know the kingdom of God is increasing during this shaking. God is shaking all things, everything that can be shaken that is not a part of his kingdom, he's shaking it. And it says at that time, we will be receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I say, bring it on. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm only encouraged about one thing. Jesus is Lord and he has paid and created the earth and it's going to be his, like it or not. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including you, uh, his people. Now, I didn't tell you this. I should have told you, but can you put up John um, 14.10? Does anybody have a Passion Bible right here? Close, you could bring it to me. I'll I'll just, I know what it says, but it'd be good. Okay, well, thank you, sweetheart. Uh, It's good to be married to a holy, holly, hallelujah woman, right? You know? (laughs) Yeah, oh, amen, and uh, I I just love it. So he says here, uh, it says here in the Passion Translation, oh, she has a Passion Translation up. What can I say? I don't need you, honey. I don't need your Bible. (laughs) That is not true, that's for sure. Now listen, this is what he says now. Oh, you got verse eight. Can you drop down? Oh, you got 1 Corinthians. Oh, sorry. Um, I I need your Bible back. (laughs) Anyway, I'll tell you what it says. It says that I live as one with the Father, and the Father lives as one with me. In John 14, 10, and 11. I live as one with the Father, and the Father lives as one with me. That's a better translation, in my opinion. And let me say this, Jesus said, I'm abiding in the Father, and I'm telling you to abide in me, in John 15. But it's, that's really what it says. Now, here it is, she put it up, is it, no, okay, anyway, it's, uh, where am I, it's John, just put it up there, John 14, 10, if you can, and in the Passion Translation. Yeah, thank you, no, I'm I'm quoting it correctly, I know, but anyway, it's, um, that's the truth, it's, it's John 14. Now listen carefully. Your life depends 
on the degree by which you abide in Christ. You can grow in the knowledge of the Lord, which causes you to abide in him more intimately. I can know you and you can know me, right? But the key to abiding in Jesus, you want to know what it is? Quality time. Reading the Bible. Meditating on the scriptures. Letting it go deep in your heart. He told Joshua, he said, look, you're going to go to war and win all these wars. But he said, be strong and very courageous. Then he told them, meditate upon my word day and night. You'll have success. Now, do we have it up there? Don't you believe that, uh, that the Father is living in me and I am living in the Father? Even my words are not my own, but, the, but come from the Father. For he lives in me and performs his miracles of power through me. Next verse is what I want. Watch, here we go. Verse 11. Do we have it? Anyway, it goes on to say in verse 11, believe that I live as one with my Father. This is important. And my father lives as one with me. You got that? Now look, I was taught some of this dominion teaching back early on, but they never told me how to abide in Christ. And you can get yourself in big trouble if you take authority that you really don't have that union with the Lord. But I'm teaching you how. Now listen, Jesus said in John 16, is it 13, I believe, which we don't need to go there. He said, it's better that I go Because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. Listen carefully now. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. This is how I learned this from the person of the Holy Spirit and from Jesus. You can have communion with the Trinity, you know, individually and and even um, together. But um, basically, what you'll find out is whether or not you're actually growing and learning to love. That's the way. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, it says, test yourselves and see if you are in Christ. The greatest test is, are you learning to love? Are people precious to you? Today, Pam and I and some of us who knew her, Pam said it, but I would have said it anyway on the text. Perhaps the kindest Christian I've ever met Married her, Pam and I married her and her husband. I think it was 37 years ago, 36 years. He came, he was in our house in 1979 when we started a small Bible study, became our first church. It, probably by January or February, April, May, whatever, is when I met Joe. Anyway, she passed away today at uh, 2.45 or something in the morning. And um, perhaps she was the kindest Christian I've ever met. Her mother was remarkable. Her mother owned and operated, it was called the Artifactory in Malibu, and she helped people for years with clothes and everything else. Her name was Honey Coatsworth. Amazing. But she died, and so this morning, I was thinking the same thing. Pam came in, you know, and said to me, Lisa had texted us and said, you know, life is precious. People must become precious to you and me because of the love of God. Bob Jones, when he died, he came back and he said, I saw what the Lord was asking everybody that was in the right line. Most of them were in the other line. They were in the right line. He asked them all the same question. Did you learn to love? Oh, I wonder why he asked that question. First commandment, love God. Second commandment, love each other. I'm gonna close in a few minutes because Pam has something that's important as well and I want her to have freedom But um, I I think I'll just go to uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. Excuse me, 2 Timothy 2.22. And this is something that God is doing in your life as you are one like these people. He said, uh, this is in the middle of a thought of of Paul, but he said, flee (coughs) evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, and love. Faith, righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with what? Along with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. This is 
the big issue that we're going to find because the church is going to slowly start moving more into homes and small groups for various reasons. And um, we'll have to, I always tell people, this is what I found to be the best counsel I've ever, uh, some of the counsel, best counsel I've ever had or that I got, obviously. But do your best to stay within the sphere and influence of the fruit of the Spirit. That way I find people that do, and everybody's people are at different degrees, but there are some people that are there 95% of the time when I talk to them. Maybe 100, but I'm not sure. And others that aren't. Myself could be included. I mean, wherever people, uh, you know, it's not always easy to catch everything you do totally great. You know, you're in a hurry or you're this or you're that. For me, my, one of my biggest challenges is I've got about four people that sometimes I have to talk to before or after service, and so I'm a little distracted, and it's just, you know, whatever you, whatever you do. But generally, when we're in contact with people, offense can be a big issue with some. Their opinion, their feeling, a certain doctrine, whatever, and it dominates but what needs to dominate through you and I to show that we're being led by God and sons and daughters of God is that we're led by the Holy Spirit and he imparts his fruit to you. And the more that you yield to that, the more it becomes the environment in which you live and give and receive. And Pam and I and many others you know, I'm sure that it's, I hope it's true with all of you, that you have a connection with people that have a pure heart, that see God in different le levels. We're going up in revelation, knowledge of the Lord. But this is one of the most truthful things I've ever experienced. It's wonderful. This is now Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Paul says, contend for the, it says, uh, walk worthy of the Lord and maintain the unity of the Spirit. What the heck is that? Oh, it's the unity that the Holy Spirit has with Jesus and God the Father, and you get invited into it. Not everybody's going in that direction. People, you know, blah, 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 you know, and uh, problems this, so, you know, we gravitate toward gossip or this or judging or whatever. But the bottom line is, he says, if you're gonna be able to grow together, you're going to need to connect with people that have a pure heart. Call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. So what we should do is look to ourselves first. That's what I do. It's not like, well, you know, bless God. No. I'm just saying, Lord, I want to have a pure heart. I want to be able to have you bring me into a relationship with people who are calling upon the Lord out of a sincere and pure heart. You'll know them when you meet them because there's peace there. You'll know them when you meet them because you'll go deeper in God quicker when you're together because the Holy Spirit says, this one's in unity with me, this one's in unity with me, this one's in unity with me, and now I'm in your midst. I have been in meetings, I'm just gonna be real honest, in small groups with leaders. The Holy Spirit in the testimony of Jesus was so real you would have thought you were talking and communicating with people in the middle of the throne of God. What do I mean by that? And it's, it's gone hundreds of, hundreds of times. I mean, the oracles of God were there. That is, the Holy Spirit is speaking openly, and we're getting it all together. I'll be honest, this is what our uh, leadership meetings are like. It's exactly what they're like. And so I'm learning and I'm getting corrected sometimes, you know, <laughs> whatever. But it's like, it's all good. Like I say, Jenny right over here, she's, my, she's the best corrector. Oh. oh no, oh no, no, no. I'm telling you, this woman is golden to me and Pam. Not that Marnie and the others are not, I'm just saying, as a corrector, she's so good. And of course, I know it's God because my wife has already told me these things. So, can I get a witness, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I'm saying, 
you know, it used to be people come up, well, are you an apostle? I heard that you were ordained as an apostle. Are you a prophet? I heard that you were ordained as an apostle. I said, I submit to you. I said, look, as long as you're kind, I submit to you too. You don't need to say those things. Usually it's the people that say it are the ones that end up being a trial. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's just the way that it exposes everything. It's like there are so many people who have never said that to me and never will. They don't have to. We, we love each other. And uh, it's just uh, amazing. So I think I'm going to finish on that high note, Pam. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I didn't read John while my wife's getting up here. I want to go to John 14 or John 15, 7 through uh, 4 through 7. I want to tell you that what I'm teaching to you, your life depends on it. So I don't want you to think I'm just uh, thinking that I'm a hot shot or something. I'm not. I'll just... I'll just uh, Say what Jesus said. Is that okay? Right. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Remain in me or abide in me, live in union with me, and I also will remain in you. That's a condition. You remain in me, I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. And that was the first thing I ever saw as a little new pastor preaching, and I would see the ticker, t- ticker tape. Without me, you can do nothing. And that was not what was being preached in the group that I was in. And I realized the Lord was directing me over to him directly. That was in 1980. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit. Neither can you. Oh, where to go? Bear fruit of itself uh, in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Let's keep going. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you. If, 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 conditional, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That was the verse that I got. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and are burned. Verse 7, if you remain, again, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. We could go on and on and on. Abiding in Jesus, your life depends on it. And think about it in Jesus' name. You are the ones that the Lord wants to bring right into the front lines and begin to move back the gates of hell. It's not a political thing. It's a kingdom thing. And it's in, already in operation in our church for many years. And you're going to join it if you hang around. But our goal is to abide in Jesus Christ in him alone by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You know, Rick. Yeah. What about Kara? What? We'll do that after you. Kara, okay. you come up after Pam to do your testimony. I want to try to spit this out fast. Um, okay, take my time. You know, just want to mention, we forgot to mention that Paul Keith and Amy Davis are going to be with us in two weeks, um, the weekend of January 20th, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday twice. They're going to, and then they fly out that evening. They've really been, um, I think I can use the word commissioned by the Lord to sow into this church. And uh, that's a really holy thing because Paul Keith and Amy have been called to prepare the bride. I mean, he's been rock solid for, I don't know how many years, associated with Morningstar and so many great ministries. Very, very solid, uh, both of them. And so they're coming. So I really, we really want to encourage you to make a point because I can bet you that things are going to pop up. It's going to become inconvenient to come you're going to feel, I don't even want to say it, not sick. You're not going to get sick. You're not going to have that. But there's going to be resistance. So really want to encourage you that the Lord has sent them to us to prepare us. And uh, it's not like, oh, let's invite Paul, Keith, and Amy, and oh, yeah, we'll come. No, it was really uh, of the Lord. And uh, Rick and Paul, Keith connected first time for like, at least an hour over the phone, just boom, 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 the Holy Spirit, just real um, affinity there. So I want to encourage you to come to that, so let you know about that. Is it cold in here? Yeah. Yeah, could we, Al, can we turn, get the heat up? 
Yeah, he, he got right up. Um, okay, this is just very, well, I don't even want to say it's very simple, but what I feel the Lord's impressed upon me today that he wants you to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are being trained for what's ahead. You're not going to be thrown into something that you cannot handle. As you pursue and as we obey what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, he is preparing us. He would be cruel, really cruel, to not prepare us. Why would he ever want to not prepare us? But sometimes we think the enemy says, hey, you're struggling now. What are you going to do when it gets rougher? I mean, it's the first, I had it written down, you said it when you stood up. Obviously, birth pangs are increasing. They're not going to let up. We're in labor. It's happening. And so, you know, Rick said that to me this last week, and I kind of flashed on the three, our three children that, that I delivered, and the extreme intensity of it and the complete incapability to do it without some training. Now drugs have gotten in there and really helped. I did have an epidural with, with Laura, um, which was wonderful. Um, you were on the phone two minutes afterwards. Yeah, drugs do help at times. Uh, but anyway, the intensity with the first two of going through birth pains and that's what Jesus called what we are going to be going through and the mercy of that is that they don't start out with a bang they keep increasing so we're being trained as it gets tougher we're being trained and I flashed on our son's military training he was in the army and they trained him, he had uh, special operations training. It was unbelievable what they trained him with. I, I, I'm glad I didn't know some of it when it was going on, but they had one school called uh, SEER. What was it, survival, escape, something, something. And they trained them if they were caught. I honestly didn't wanna even hear what they did to them. But it was training for what was ahead. So if something happened, they were trained. They weren't caught off guard. And the military is struggling now, but when our son was in, it was really powerful. He had air over him when they went in on the ground. It was just very incredible. They trained, they only were on a deployment one month out and then they trained for three then one month then they trained so what makes this thing i mean the enemy is lying to us your life is random you're nothing's really happening you're not what are you doing you're just living out your daily life no in the midst of that what is going on is a specific training regiment set by the lord for you personally because only he knows every weakness that we have and every strength hey duke it's my grandson our grandson um so he has us very specifically and okay the main thing that I believe he's talking to me about, that he is training us in the main thing, obviously, finding him, hearing his voice. But what is critical to the future is that we have to learn not to live out of our own strength, but to live out of his. Now, <laughs> oh, I wish I could just read that. Okay, live, don't live out of my own strength, live out of his. No, it doesn't work that way. Obviously, how he does it is through circumstances in our lives that are beyond our ability to cope with. Otherwise, we're not gonna shift. I'm gonna stay in what I can do. 
It's amazing as humans how we default to ourselves and our own ability, our own strengths. It's just, we do that, it's comfortable. I can handle this, or I'm used to this. Okay, this isn't new. You know, whatever keeps us happy, but the Lord must take us through circumstances, and you know this, this is your life, into things that you don't have the ability to do because he has to shift. I got to get you off yourself onto me. Okay, and I'm just got one verse, I mean one, uh, one verse to go to today. We're going to read it out of three translations. But he has, again, he's got to shift us. And he's the only one that can do it. And he knows us inside and out. So he knows it's tailor-made. And I'm not even talking about just difficult circumstances, like bad things happening. Not even, it's not just that. It's pressures in our mind. It's what triggers us, what's difficult for us. There were moments, I'll just say it, during uh, the holidays that I just felt completely overwhelmed with what needed to be done. And he had to deal with me in that realm. And so it's not just, oh, you have it tough. There are things in our minds that overwhelm us and patterns from the past that discourage us. And so he uses all of that to show us that he is right there to pour his life into us, like he did today. I mean, worship was tremendous. Thank you. It was just tremendous. Are you married? You are. Okay, do you have any kids? Okay, I just feel that the Lord just wants you to know that his timing is perfect in your life and that he has ordered your life a certain way that hasn't possibly matched up with what you had maybe planned, but that it is very specific to your training for ministry and training for worship leading. And so you are right on his schedule, you and your husband. I just want to encourage you with that. So be very, his hand is greatly on you. You're in a real sovereign season of growth and development. And so um, he's just saying, I've got it set. I've got the, the times are in my hand. So amen. 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 Yeah, such a blessing. You just sang beautifully. Okay, let's just look real quickly at um, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. I'm going to read it out of the NIV. We're familiar with this, but we have to, this, this explains it all. This is Paul speaking, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9 in the NIV. Then we're going to read it in the Passion. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the hardships we suffered, uh, and I've said before, in the province of Los Angeles. We were under great pressure, and here it is, far beyond our ability to endure. It has to be not a little bit beyond, far beyond. Because he wants to shift you to him and his limitless ability. Ours is limited, finite, will fail. I mean, we know that. I'm failing in that constantly. But he's teaching me, go to me, get my, come. My strength is flowing to you all the time. 24-7, I'm going to teach you how to rely on me and train you and not on yourself. So that's what he's training us in. So we're in this uncomfortable place of repeatedly being in circumstances or feelings that are beyond our abilities. This is good. I know I've shared this before, but it came up again so strong. 
because the enemy lies to us. There is such purpose in you living out your daily life and making your choices. And Rick Joyner was just teaching, and if you haven't watched some of the vision conference you need, it's up online. It's been phenomenal. Their year-end uh, conference, Chris Reed, and uh, I wouldn't miss anything Rick Joyner says. It's just incredible. But he talked about briefly about how highly living out our daily life is esteemed before the Lord in heaven. And that the news is all dramatic, exciting things. That's not the real reality of our lives. Because he said if it wasn't that way, nobody would listen to, to the news. It would be boring. But how highly esteemed and how vital it is that we live out our going to work, coming home, raising children homeschooling, teaching, whatever being, uh, whatever you're called to do, that is the training ground that is changing you bit by bit. And the Lord will guarantee that we will triumph in these days ahead as we just continue to persevere and, and spend time with him and follow through on what he's saying. It's not, I mean, he's guaranteed victory because he, we're following him. Okay. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. You're supposed to be feeling that. Death to your own abilities, death to your own strength. Because you won't shift otherwise. I won't shift. I'll just hang on, trying to get by, striving, doing my very best, which isn't good enough. And it's not freeing, it's bondage. We're in slavery. He wants us freely drinking, freely receiving. Freely amazed at what he's doing through us. Marnie's or the Holy Spirit's ex, uh, exhortation through Marnie. I want you living in the gifts of the Spirit. I want you functioning. We really won't do that unless we've been forced to let go. I'm just like hanging on. No, no, Pam, no. You can't do it. Shift. Now, do it in my strength, my ability, my life. It's a mystery, but yet it's also very practical. And you're all lip walking it out. But it's a sign of his favor that it's difficult. It's a sign of his training. It's not a sign that he's aggravated, disappointment, or moved away from you. He's very close. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But th here we, here's the reason. There's a reason. It's unto something. But this happened that we, what? Might not rely on ourselves who raises the dead. Okay, listen to it in the, tr in the Passion. Isn't it happened for that reason that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead? Okay, so listen to, let's just hear it again. Brothers, uh, okay, you know what? Start in eight if that's okay, Betsy, thanks. Second Corinthians 1 8. Brothers and sisters, you need to know about the severe trials we experienced while we were on the West Coast. Why not? All of the hardships we passed through crushed us beyond our ability to endure. There it is again, beyond our ability. Has to be beyond our ability or we won't live by his ability. 
He crushed us beyond our ability to endure, to function. For me, it sounds so crazy to get through some of the needs of the holiday and some of the things that came up. And we were so completely overwhelmed. Have you been completely overwhelmed? Yes. You're supposed to be completely overwhelmed. That's actually good news. We hate it. It's you're on your way to victory out of your own ability. Oh, we could sing that. <laughs> you're on your way to victory out of your own ability. And we were so completely overwhelmed that we were about to give up entirely. Okay, verse 9. It felt like we had a death sentence written upon our hearts, and we still feel it to this day. But it has taught us, it has trained us, where, let's read it out loud, to lose all faith in ourselves. Oh, 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 oh. it has taught us, trained us, forced us, to lose all faith in ourselves and to place all of our trust, there's that all of our trust in the God who, what does he do? Raises. Raises the dead. There's no limit to what he can do. Okay, I gotta just read it one more time. The message. Well, he's just saying, I am so active in your life. I mean, when I think of the precise military training that our son went through, I mean, they, they learned to un, uh, take their gun apart and put it back together in the dark because they did night missions. I mean, they had to jump out of aircraft over and over. I mean, everything was over and over and over. That's what the Lord's doing daily and daily. I don't want you living out of yourself. It wears you out. That's not the way I've ordained it, but you'll default to that as with your human nature. So I've got to over and over again put you in circumstances or allow them, even what the enemy brings, is used for our training. Okay, Second uh, Corinthians, great, this is perfect, thanks Betsy. We don't want you in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when all this came down on us in Asia province. It was so bad, we didn't think we were going to make it. I mean, these are the apostles who walked with Jesus. We felt like we'd been sent to death row, that it was all over for us. As it turned out, it was Let's just read that. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Keep reading. Instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. Not a bad idea since he's the God who raises the dead. <laughs> Forced, you get the word forced. Forced to trust God. It's amazing he doesn't just throw up his hands and go, I give up. He loves this. He loves working with us. He loves being so intimately involved in our lives. I was thinking about communion. We chew the representation of his body. We swallow his blood. It goes throughout our body. I mean, this is what he's saying. I am so involved with every aspect of your life. I delight in this. This is what I'm going for because I see the future. I'm gonna see you shine. I'm gonna see you be my body on this earth and heal the sick, raise the dead. Touch people's lives, prophesy to them, 
Smile, like Andrea said. Help them get something off the top shelf in the grocery store. I mean, it's all a part of life, and it's all part of what the Lord is delighted to see us doing. Okay. Um, Yeah, I think that's clear enough. Praise the Lord. Isn't he awesome? You're in his hands. Yeah, let's really, let's give it. Lord, you're amazing. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for showing us the wisdom of God. The wisdom, the wisdom. He's giving us wisdom that if the rulers of this age had known, they would never have crucified the Lord. If the, everything they've shot at you is gonna backfire. It's all for our good. I mean, it's like shocking, really? Are you sure, Lord? Yes, he says it. That's how awesome, you know, God is awesome. Anyway, God is awesome. He, It'd be one thing to take a bunch of st uh, strong, self-reliant, independent people and make them great. How about taking us, weak, needy, desperate people, I love it, and change us into him, him. Not a better us, him, that's the goal. Isn't that shocking? Him. We're gonna be like Jesus. Glory to God. Okay, praise the Lord. Amen. We just love you. I think that's my grandson. He's crying for me, or Pam. Kara, come on up. Where are you, Kara? We've got a testimony here, and then Betsy is uh, after that. Oh, yeah. I'll be fast. I'm sure you guys are probably ready to go. Um, and, and then also what Pastor Pam keeps talking about, you know, one of the blessings of tithing is, is that uh, we won't bear our fruit out of season. We won't bear fruit. The Lord will cause us to not bear fruit. So he's preparing us for that right time, you know? I just always love that. So he won't, let us, he won't bring us to that next place and let us, you know, fail publicly. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I'm uh, a little late this morning, it was late night last night, I'm driving to church, and of course I'm like, ah, hair on fire, I get in my car, and I'm out of gas, it's like, it's like you got six miles left, <laughs> I'm like, okay, great, so I'm, ah, so pull, so pull off to get gas, and I use Apple Pay all the time, so I'm swiping, Apple Pay is not working, okay, I guess it's the pump, and I go inside, and the guy behind the register, he's just cool. He's just like, Happy New Year. He's just cool. I love LA. I love the people in the city. <laughs> I, can, I can just go back and forth with complete strangers. They're just, I just love this city. Um, and, but I'm, you know, and I was like, Oh, do you have Apple Pay? You know, I'm, uh, okay, my blah, blah, blah. It's not working. He says, Yeah, we have it. So I get ready to, I get, as I'm getting, as I'm trying to scan it, he's, he's talking with me, and I get this thought, you know, of, it's like, Yeah, you're late, but, Give him this moment, give him this time, you know, respect it, you know? He's wanting to engage a little bit. So, um, back and forth, a little cool banter, and uh, I realize that I've, I have a new, it's a new old iPhone, and I, all, none of my cards have transferred. <laughs> so I have no money. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I don't have my, my cards on this phone, and rare occasion I had five bucks and I was like oh I got five bucks I was like maybe this will get me to church and back <laughs> so I say that to him five bucks and he goes no I got this and I thought was he the owner or just gonna let it go no he pulls out his personal phone and gives me 20 bucks and he goes and I go and I did that and I go no 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 hug so I came gave him a hug no, nothing creepy, nothing creepy. Just, it was just, and, a, and we both embraced. And I walk out, you know, you know, 
thank you, thank you, get in my car. And I heard the Lord say, I just, I just expelled a demon. And I assume from him, maybe even both of us. Doesn't matter, <laughs> take it, <laughs> take it. I just expelled a demon. And I felt it was the sign of what's coming. That's why I told Pastor Rick. It's the sign of the provision that's coming, supernatural provision. When I left Pastor Rick and I told him during worship, I sat back down and the Lord said, the Holy Spirit said, you were right. And I, I, I didn't get it. I assumed, I'm sort of thinking about last night. And he said, it's a sign. So praise God. The Gathering Place, 